everyone welcome back to my shop and you're gonna say oh he did some work on it got his decals on well just this on on this vertical stab and down here and and the star and that's it I'm gonna show you how I do it so this side is blank <laughs> so don't worry that I'm not gonna show that um, where we're gonna go from here is to the fuel tank and I'm gonna tell you a little story about the fuel tank uh, I went to test fit everything. I cut the tubing and made the runs that I wanted to make and stuck all the tubing on there. And when I got it all fitted just right, I went to pull the tubing off the tank and they're not coming off. And I don't want to rip and tear on it. So I'm just going to leave it and show you the installation just the way it goes. Um, and before I do that, before I show you the tank, I want to show you a little quick tip about the workings of the tank, um, the way I set it up, and which just so happens to be the way they set this tank up in this P40, which is really nice. So uh, hold on a second, we'll start out with a quick tip, and then we'll get right into the tank. You're looking at an old fuel line part. You have the clunk, the overflow, the fuel line, the rubber stopper. And let's say you uh, make a hard landing and maybe in the weeds, dead stick or a little bounce on the nose wheel and nothing wrong with your model. So you take it back to the flight line, you try to start it up and it won't start. So you take the tank out and you find that the line has come up and flipped over the top and got caught up on the overflow or something like that or just stuck up here like this there's a way to stop that and this is the trick that I always do and I've been doing this for many many years is I'll install a little piece of brass tubing into the fuel line put a couple of marks in here Take my little cutter, cut out a chunk of this fuel line, like that. Insert your brass tubing, like so. Now you still have a nice weighted clunk. This fuel line's a little stiff, but. You get the idea. And it'll never flip back on itself. And that is the quick tip for this little segment. To get started, I wanted to show you a few items I used to install the tank. And first off is this 8th inch ID Tigon fuel line and a tubing cutter. It's my weapon of choice. You can use an X-Acto knife or a pair of scissors or whatever to cut your Tigon fuel line. I use some eighth inch aluminum tubing and there it is. And what I use that for is to run uh, the overflow to the outside of the plane and I use it to run uh, the pickup line through the firewall so I can connect it up to the carburetor with a piece of Tigon line. I use some 8th inch landing gear straps which fit perfectly over top of the aluminum tubing on the outside of the plane to hold it in place for the overflow. And some rubber, foam rubber uh, tape to uh, kind of give the fuel tank a little bit of shock support. I don't believe it's really necessary, but I use foam on that just to keep the abrasions down. Before I show you the insides of the plane and the fuel tank and stuff, uh, I'm going to bring up my whiteboard and a few drawings. Uh, I just thought it'd be easier to explain the workings of the tank on the whiteboard because I can't get it out of my plane. And over the years, I've noticed some people have done their tanks wrong, set them up wrong. Uh, for instance, I had a guy come out there, went to fill up his plane, 
and as soon as he started filling it, it came out the overflow. Well, come to find out, he had his lines mixed up. And uh, like I mentioned before, uh, had some instances with myself when I was very young. Uh, landing in the weeds, kind of hitting, hitting the weeds and having the plane flip over hard onto its nose. A few hard landings on the nose and had the clunk flip up. And that's what the quick tip was all about. Stop that from happening before you have to experience trying to figure that kind of thing out. So I'm going to bring up the whiteboard and show you the layout of the tank on the inside. Two different setups, a nitro and a gas. Um, the nitro can go either way. The gas is the way the P40 is set up. So uh, give me a second. I'm going to pull up the whiteboard. I'm going to bore you for a second with my bad drawings and explain the tank. So uh, if you can kind of bear with me on this, I'll get this over with quick. On the top here, this is the nitro gas setup. And this is what I like using on pretty much everything that I have. And the basic setup is on the starboard side, I have my pressure line. And it comes out and goes to the muffler for muffler pressure. Or on a gasser, this would just go down outside the bottom of the fuselage somewhere and act as vent. And in the back here, I use a fairly heavy clunk on pretty much all of my uh, fuel tanks. Then you have your piece of Tigon tube or the Flex Pro from Sullivan is my favorite actually. Piece of brass tubing, another chunk of fuel line going to the brass or aluminum tube going out the stopper. Two, uh, a fill valve of some kind to the carburetor and the fill valve I prefer I'm not kind of, I'm not really trying to endorse these or anything but I like these uh, these ones here from du Dubro has a little plug-in deal that fits it and uh, you can fuel from the the fill line without flooding your carburetor and on the p40 down here it has an overflow on the starboard side and has a 90 degree nipple and it's cut off fairly close to the top of the tank for the overflow. On the port side is the fill side and it connects to a fuel proof tubing of some kind. I'm not really sure what it is. And the bottom's cut at an angle so it won't have any kind of blockage against the bottom of the tank. And on the pickup side it has a pretty heavy clunk on it and a piece of fuel line. I'm not really sure what kind they use and a piece of brass tubing and some more fuel line going to the stopper and it has a connector there for the tubing coming through the stopper and then that goes to the carburetor. That's the two setups I, I wanted to cover. Uh, like I said on the top is my favorite pretty much on everything I, I build except for the P40 and the reason I'm not doing this is I couldn't find any place solid enough to mount the fill valve so I had to go a different route. You can see the tank is in place. It's being held in there by a velcro strap. In the back I glued in a piece of spruce and you can see the foam tape on here and the two white lines underneath that go to the front and the sides of the tank are braced up with little quarter inch pieces of balsa and uh, small pieces of triangular stock in the front. Quarter inch balsa on both sides, triangular stock on each side and another little piece of quarter inch balsa in the front keeps it from sliding forward and it's in there pretty solid. This is the overflow and the overflow I'll show you in a second comes out the side of the model this is the fill line. The fill line just goes up inside, loops back, and comes out right here. Okay? And that's being held in by a piece of Velcro, of course. And I made a little cradle for the hose. And it comes out there. It has a fuel dot in there to keep the fuel from running all over the place. And it slides back in there. Secured in place with the Velcro. It won't be flopping around. 
and you can see the clunk on the inside has a little chunk of fuel line then it hooks to a piece of brass tubing then to another piece of fuel line to the stopper and then in the front here which you can't see is a piece of fuel line tubing connected to the the stopper then it connects to a piece of aluminum tubing the eighth inch and the eighth inch aluminum goes out through the firewall and on the other side of the firewall it's connected to the carburetor intake fuel intake with another piece of uh, eighth inch fuel line tubing the overflow connects to this eighth inch aluminum tubing it comes out the side of the engine box here held in place by eighth inch landing gear strap and it exits out the bottom of the cowling in the back uh, where the cooling fins are on the cowling for easy access it sticks out there quite a ways easy to plug in a piece of fuel line to go to a let's say a separate overflow tank or something like that the fuel line pickup comes out here the aluminum tube comes to here and the piece of fuel line goes over top and hooks to the carburetor it's just one straight shot and all the the bends are in the aluminum tubing going to the tank so it connects straight into the tank and I mentioned before on the top of the firewall box I mounted my CDI the power wire and the tack wire go inside the little hole I made on top let me roll this up on its side real quick and the hall sensor wire is held in place by a couple of chunks of velcro and it comes around the front of course the hall sensor and that is about it as far as uh, the parts in the nose so I suppose we'll get to uh, mounting the cowling by the way there's one more thing I need to show you and that is let me use this little scrap piece of wood as the spark plug wire comes down the opposite side and it's held on by a piece of velcro here and one underneath and it keeps it out of the way of the exhaust and keeps it centered uh, and that is it so now we'll get on with cowling let's get on with the cowl okay first thing I do is I take my spinner back plate and I glue let's see what I did with it little pieces of 3 32nd balsa using some uh, quick set CA just a little little drop and I glue it to the back side of the of the spinner onto the cowling right on the edge on the inside here where uh, it's, it's not going to show even if it leaves a mark so that's what I do and then I glue I'll center up the the back plate of the spinner and glue it to the scrap pieces of balsa around the opening and so it looks like that and there's a nice narrow gap 332nd gap between the cowling and the spinner back plate then let me move things around here then what I do is I take a, a piece of paper and I'll tape it to the side of my fuselage and I scribble over the top of it where the tabs are for mounting the cowling so I know exactly where they are and I can make a straight line of screws instead of having them all you know all over the place and that's what the, this is for so let me slide the cowling on and one thing about doing this this way is that your engine will be centered exactly where you want it when you mount your cowl All right, let's see if I can get this thing on here. Get it behind the paper. Find my prop shaft, there we go. And I slide it on there as far as I can. Something seems to be in the way. There it goes. There. get this paper laid nice and flat just like that 
Now all I have to do is make sure the cowling is exactly where I want it and drill one side and then another making sure this is all the way back as far as it can go the, the spinner back, back plate is touching the engine hub crankshaft hub and it will stay there and your alignment will be just perfect so give me a second I'm going to drill these out and set the screws in and you can see uh, how it comes out back in a minute I'm all finished with the drilling and the putting in of the screws now I need to cut away this balsa wood that's holding the spinner back plate on and that should be no problem real quick just kind of run this around cut it loose Ooh, that one's gonna be a problem there we go and just slide this back plate off you see just a little bit of, of wood back here easy to clean off not a big deal and then I'll take the rest of it off with a piece of sandpaper that's it you can see this back plate is actually a red back plate and they sprayed it black uh, not the best in the world but hey, it works clean the rest of this off I'm gonna cut away for a minute and I'm gonna clean this all off and get it back down to the paint and then I'll be back and I believe I don't think you need to need to see me drill out a prop and the back plate or anything like that so I'm gonna skip all that and go right to uh, the decals because I think that is what we're coming down to besides putting these on here which are just uh, set on here and they're glued I don't like them much I thought about making a new one um, basically carving a few of these out and then put making my uh, mixing up some of my rubber mold material make rubber mold of them then cast them with uh, polyester resin and make some decent looking exhaust but I'm not really sure if I'm going to do that or not at least not this time around I might buy a new cowling and then do that so um, give me a few minutes and I'll be back and we'll get these decals put on here to cut out my decals I use three different uh, cutting tools one is a large pair of scissors very sharp these are fairly new a small pair of scissors to get around the corners a lot easier than using the big ones and a scalpel to cut out any inside part of the decal I don't want and I'm gonna start with the star on the side and you probably figured that out because of the way the things are situated and what I did is I measured out from this corner on the other side where the other star is I measured that one off the corner of where the canopy sits and it came out to 78 millimeters and I put a mark right there showing me that this where the straight line actually goes and here's the star you can see I cut it out very close to the blue as close as I could without cutting into the blue you're gonna see a little bit of white which is the backing uh, and then where the widest part of the circle is touches that center spot and it gives me an approximate placement for the decal okay and that's gonna go right about there somewhere and I'm gonna flip this around a couple of times and find the exact location but as far as how far forward and back it goes this is where it's gonna be so let's get started putting that on and what I have is just a it, this was an empty bottle of well it looks like fabric freshener of some kind and I put just uh, dish soap and some water in here and I'll wet this side down I usually use on smaller stuff I don't use my fingers but in this case I'm using my fingers I'm gonna put a little bit of spray on the back side of the star so it slips around 
So this chevron is going to sit somewhere in here. And to get it level, I'm going to have to turn things and I'm going to be working out of the frame. So uh, give me a second. I'm going to position it and then I'll be back. It's in the position that I like. When I look from the top, the points on the stars, which this side and the other side, are meeting right in the center, which is just perfect. And then I had to level it out according to the canopy line right here, because that's pretty much level. Um, I don't use the monocoat line because it actually is running on an angle upwards, so I don't use that. I'm just kind of dabbing off all the excess around the edges. And this is just a plastic card that they send you in the mail when you want you to buy a, or want you to sign up for a credit card. I take these and I use them as squeegees. And I'm going to place my thumb on here and I'm going to squeegee out the water from behind it. And it also gets rid of all the air bubbles at the same time. I usually go from the top to the bottom but I'm in a funny angle that it doesn't work out that way so let me try it anyways and you can see the water draining out see all the water all the excess and on the other one I had a little problem getting it to stay down until it started to dry out a little bit because of the compound curves not a big deal you just have to work it until all the air bubbles are out the best you can. And the surface underneath the decal is not very good. It's not level, it's not flat. There's some bumps in it and you can see probably right in here and there's some spots up in like right here that's actually underneath the covering material so there's nothing I can do about that. And after I squeegee out all the air bubbles, I use a paper towel to remove more of the air bubbles. There's a little tiny one right in the middle. It's driving me crazy here, and I can't get it out. It's not moving. I think there's a, a flaw in the, uh, the covering material. And that is it. I'm going to let that sit and dry. And... Uh, come back and we'll see what else has to be done well there it is it's in place I have all the water as much as I could out from behind the decal or the sticker whatever you want to call it and uh, that's basically how I do them all all of my decals on this plane or stickers whatever you want to call them uh, to give you an example of some of the cutting work I, I do on my numbers. Uh, give me a second and I'll grab a few. Okay, there's a two. I hope you can see that right. Um, you can see I, I cut it just like the chevron, very close to the black. That way I don't have any of that nasty clear sticker around that gets oil and dirt build up. And let me show you another one. Of course, that's the number nine. And on the inside of the circle, I cut that out with the scalpel. And there's a four also that is basically the same. Cut out this center triangle with the scalpel. And those go up onto the vertical stabilizer. I, I I'm not going to do that right now, but uh, doing the chevron gives you the gist of the process. Okay, well let's move on to something else. I put on all the decals that I care to put on, and you can see it's pretty much done. Uh, but decals, no big deal, just the soapy water and the squeegee and line them up, lay them down, squeegee the water out, pat it down, get rid of the extra water and uh, that's all there is to it. I'm sure you guys have all done it a thousand times too, so no big deal. Um, 
Moving on to something else, uh, it's primarily done. Everything has been done except for one thing, and that is balancing. As I assembled the fuselage, I kept a pretty close watch on the balance. And on the inside here, I think I showed this before, I have a couple tape marks here and a little line on them to show me where the center of gravity is supposed to be. And I kept with that pretty much through the whole fuselage assembly. And uh, I think it should be pretty close. One thing I am worried about is with the retracts in the up position is going to drop the center of gravity back to make it, well actually, yeah, back. And I'm afraid it's going to be a little tail heavy. Um, so what I'm going to do is set this up and we're going to check the center of gravity and see where I'm at and we'll go from there. This is the center of gravity jig they want you to use. And there's a thumb screw that goes through two plates. There's actually two pieces here. And the same on the other side. And this slides right here. Okay? It's like that. Now you slide your wing on it, locks it in place. And uh, then you take your handle here. You put a loop over this screw, a loop on the other side, and you lift the whole assembly up. And that's what I'm going to do. So give me a second to put the wing on. Uh, and then we'll lift it up and see where we're at. As you can see, I got the wings on. And uh, I have to tell you, I did a little bit of pre-balancing. Because um, tomorrow, we're having a club picnic. And I'm going to put the maiden flight on this tomorrow. So I'm going to kind of rush through this because it's getting late. I've been at the field all day cutting grass. My eyes are all messed up from my hay fever. But, uh, so I just want to get through this real quick. And uh, <clears throat> what happened is the fuselage balance. I picked it up by the, by the marks. The fuselage is balancing by itself. But once everything has been retracted, the tail wheel goes back, both landing gear go back, it put me 1.75 pounds tail heavy. That's what it took to balance it out by putting the, the weight on the engine box itself, inside the engine box. Yeah, it took a pound and three quarters to uh, get it to balance. I'm not real thrilled about that, but actually it's better than the last P40. My original with the air retracts, the version one, or generation one had air retracts and that for some reason had to have uh, a little over two pounds of lead in the nose to uh, balance it out so this is what i come up with uh, i'll let you take a look and uh, this is how they want you to balance it just by picking this up i'm slightly nose heavy but uh, i can live with that And that was the last thing to do. Now I'm ready to take it out to the field. I'll charge my batteries up uh, probably on the way to the field and uh, get them all balanced on the way because it's a 40 minute drive so and these batteries were topped off maybe about a week maybe two weeks ago and I haven't used it much so that's that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put this away and uh, we'll pick it up tomorrow and uh, I'll show you the field uh, show you the maiden flight hopefully it comes out good we'll see because sometimes things don't go the way you plan and uh, I guess we'll go from there so I'll see you in the car on my way to the field I uh, got about another 35 miles to go but uh, I got everything in the car hopefully I brought everything because it's a long ways back if I forgot something I was supposed to go out there yesterday during our club picnic but it didn't turn out to be a very good day for flying the wind was crosswind blowing about 17 miles an hour so um, I kind of let it go 
and uh, now it's the day after it's Sunday however we're gonna have some guys out there to fly and uh, hopefully um, our district 8 representative will show up uh, he's the vice president AMA district 8 supposed to be out at our field he wanted to come out and see it today so I figured this would be a good day to, to do a little filming so uh, I'm gonna back out of here now concentrate on the tourist traffic because where I live there's a lot of tourists and uh, they get in the way <laughs> and they're unpredictable so I'm gonna get off here and I'll pick it up when I get to the field well, we're at the Gladwin Area RC Club Field, and this is to the north, facing the airport. Our spotter stand, where we watch out for full-size aircraft. And a quick scan of our field. We got little plane benches out there, and some work benches along the flight or the parking line. Concrete pads for large-scale starts. And behind me is our pavilion. And we just had our picnic here yesterday. And our flagpole and our and our exit sign right there. This is the view from the spotter stand. We have an umbrella that we put up here and a chair for the spotter. And uh, again looking towards the north. You see our windsock there. The wind's coming, looks like right out of the south. We, we sit kind of on an angle. And where we're pointing is straight north. Right now where the camera's pointing. And the terminal for the airport is right there, that little building in the center. And beyond Beyond the terminal there is the Gladwin County Fairgrounds. Now taking a sweep to the east, we have the flying field itself, which is almost 800 foot long, all grass as you can see. And that's pointing towards the south. Our flight line is 273 feet. And in the front, right here, you can see a water spigot sticking up. That's so we can water our grass. We have water out here for that. It's non-potable, so it's not for drinking. It's just for spraying on the grass to keep it green. And the parking area. Pavilion again. Okay, facing to the north, this is our additional parking area. Uh, they allow camping here, so we have guests that come and they'll set up their campers over there and stay the night before a fly-in or something. And pointing towards the south goes our entrance. And we got a little more additional parking that way. Well, I'm not too good at this selfie thing, so uh, I'll make this quick. I'm going to unload my car, get my plane set up, and I'm going to wait here until the rest of the guys show up and try to record this made in flight. So we'll see how it goes. Be back in a minute.
Yep. Well, there you have it. The maiden flight's over with. Uh, I did have some problems that I didn't mention as I was putting this thing together. Um, and I'll bring those up right now, is that the starboard side retract has a little catch in it. And when it gets about halfway, it'll stop. It doesn't always retract. Um, I don't know why that is. I'm gonna tear it apart and repair it. That's why the gear never went up during the maiden flight. Um, and after I did the roll, the engine started to sag, leaned out, and died. Did dead stick landing. So you actually got a bonus there. You got to see how it dead sticks. And it's very predictable. Very easy to uh, set up a landing on a dead stick. Let's see, what else can I tell you about the flight? I needed to add um, about two clicks on the transmitter. You know, on the digital, it's two beeps. <laughs> and... Uh, stabilize the the roll on it and it needed uh let's see what was it two clicks of down or was it up i don't remember up or down i can't i can't recall um transfer is not here to tell you but uh not much it didn't need much once once it was airborne very predictable i would like to have a little bit more of a roll rate on high rates uh, low rates, it didn't do too bad. The roll was done in low rate, so a very scale looking roll. It looks good in the air, flies well. Uh, I have no qualms about the, the flyability of the plane. And, uh, but that sticky retract kind of bugs me. So I'm gonna take the retract out, tear it all apart, and see what's making it hang up. And there's another thing too, is that when you slide the wing tube in, and the let's say landing gear is in the down position, you take the wing tube, you slide it in, and you retract the landing gear, you can't pull the tube back out of the wing. So there's a definite bind somewhere in the framing of the wing where it's torquing down on the tube, either trying to bend the wing or pinching the tube. I don't know which it is. So there's a problem there, another design flaw. Uh, disappointed in the retracts, naturally. Uh, other than that, nothing shook apart, everything held together. Don't have any other real beefs with it, but that, uh, let's see, there was something else and I can't quite remember what it was. It was trivial, so I'm not gonna try to remember it, but, uh, I like it as far as a sport standoff scale or semi scale, whichever way you want to call it. Back in the day, we called it a standoff scale. Because if you stand off it far enough, it looks scale. Uh, <laughs> but it's a good plane. I enjoyed flying it. Even though the maiden flight was short, I got to figure out what's going on with the engine. I had it in the backyard, I test, test ran it ran great didn't have any problems but once it was airborne there was a problem so i i, I got to figure that one out can't be too much it just might have went lean um when it was unloading it just leaned out and gonna have to richen up a bit it might not be totally broken either because i didn't get a whole lot of flights on the other p40 before it bellied in and uh we'll have to see so in conclusion, it's a good plane. It's a, the structure is a little weak, even though all of the wood I added to the nose inside to beef it up didn't counterbalance the plane hardly at all. It didn't add nothing to the weight. 
and I still had to add a pound and three quarters to it, which is not as bad as the the version one. And uh, that's, I guess, is just about it. So would I recommend you to buy one of these? Sure. If you want to get into a large plane that's easy to assemble, and if you don't mind beefing it up a little bit, and if you're going to put a gas engine on it, you might not have to if it's electric. I don't know. I don't, I'm not an electric guy, so I don't know much about electrics. Um, I refuse to go that way. <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm, I'm stuck in the old days. Uh, give me nitro, give me gas, but don't give me an electric screwdriver and call it an airplane. <laughs> no, but electric's cool. I enjoy watching electrics and the guys fly those. They're quiet, but uh, yeah, it's a good plane. So with that, I'm going to close this one out, and uh, you all have a good one.